I'm Dr. Rayshon Ray speaking truth to power. And this is my daily thought. Why are reparations for African descendants of slaves way past due in the United States? Three main points. First, 40 acres and a mule was promised to African slaves and was never received. How should we make sense of this? Well, first, if we just look at some of the amount of money that slavery brought in. So for example, in 1859 alone, in Louisiana alone, mortgages that used African slaves as collateral was worth $25.7 million. And the amount of cotton produced by black slaves at one point in time in the 1800s was estimated to be nearly $30 million. Second point, all other groups who have been systematically disenfranchised by the U.S. government have received reparations. What do I mean? Well, first, we have Native Americans. Everyone knows about the Trail of Tears, pushing them out west. Native Americans have received uh, thousands and thousands of acres of land in a form of reparations for the systematic persecution that the U.S. government put upon them. Second group, Jewish Americans. And in some regards, Jews also around the world, but particularly thinking about Jewish Americans, have received and continue to receive reparations for the Holocaust. Either individuals who are still living or this money is still given to their families in the form of annual payments. Doesn't necessarily have to be just one lump sum. Third reason is that slave owners actually got reparations for losing their property, their property being African-American African slaves, once the Civil War ended and we entered Reconstruction. Part of reintegrating the Confederate South was giving them reparations for African slaves. Those three reasons alone suggest that there is a massive precedence in the United States for awarding reparations. African Americans, descendants of slaves, are the only group who have not received it. But see, we can't just stop there because see what happened right after the Civil War there was massive political and economic progress on behalf of blacks. We saw black cities flourishing. We saw uh, black politicians coming into fruition. And then both of those forms of economic and political capital that was being built started being removed. These black cities were attacked. Uh, black politicians were attacked. You even had some black sheriffs and police officers who were killed and murdered by white mobs. I mean, these sort of things, we can't necessarily separate them because right after this happened, what ended up happening was that uh, we ended up having black codes. We ended up having Jim Crow. So this whole separate and equal, I mean, it's pretty fascinating to me to hear some people, particularly African-Americans, talk about we were better under segregation. In what world was that the case? We actually weren't better under segregation. Instead, we were systematically separated from being able to gain economic capital and political capital in the form of redlining and restrictive covenants and unequal schooling and unequal opportunities for employment, which brings up something interesting when we, when we talk about, uh, in particular, how we might think about the Homestead Act, which was an act, if you've ever seen a, a Wild Wild West show or movie, I used to really like those shows and movies. And you always see, it just seems like a bunch of chaos, people trying to claim land, people trying to one-up everyone. That's because it was supposedly unclaimed land. So this logic that there wasn't enough land to give uh, African-Americans is simply false. And instead what happened is that you had white settlers who primarily moved west to claim land that supposedly people hadn't necessarily claimed before. In many regards, this was part of, of the Louisiana Purchase. This was part of the, of the Mexican-American War that led to claiming a large part of the Southwest away from Mexico. But we also can't stop there. We have to move forward to thinking about the Great Depression and World War II. Two points I'll make there. First major point is that eight out of 10 men born during the 1920s were drafted to go to war. When they returned from war, the children that they had were known as baby boomers, many of whom are still living today. So this directly impacts people who are living today. When U.S. veterans return from World War II, not just including whites, but also blacks, of course, people know about the Tuskegee Airmen, but there were several other uh, blacks who were drafted to go to war, similar to whites. They fall side by side after, of course, they realized that black soldiers were important. But of course, even in the military at that point in time, things were segregated, but the military has made tons of progress um, that at times outweighs 
what general society has done, at least in regards to race, not necessarily in regards to gender or sexual orientation. But the point is that individuals returned from war and they were given benefits for serving our country. Again, eight out of 10 men born during the 1920s. So this means in 1950s and 1960s, this impacted over 80% of families living in the United States. They were given money to go to college. They were given money to send their children to college. They were given money for down payment assistance on homes in the form of grants. And they were given money for small businesses. All things that helped to spur what we know to be the middle class today. But see, this was primarily only the white middle class because see, black veterans didn't get this same money. Instead, the GI Bill, which is still to this day one of the largest federal government initiatives in US history, these funds were mandated federally and implemented locally. So this meant that black veterans didn't necessarily get the same amount of money. The second thing revolves around social security. President Roosevelt instituted GI Bill, instituted social security, but social security excluded two main occupations, domestic and farm work. Who did that impact? 75% of blacks in the South, over 60% of blacks overall who were excluded from social security. These nest eggs that we know helped to create the middle class we know to exist today. So what's fascinating to me is that with all of the progress that's been made by African-Americans, they potentially should be heralded because in this regard, we have when affirmative action was white with GI Bill and social security that impacted whites. We have reparations for the Japanese, for Jewish Americans, for Native Americans. African-Americans are the only group who have not received these benefits. And everybody always talks about welfare. Well, look, welfare is for everyone. And in fact, there are more whites on welfare that's costing taxpayers money than blacks in terms of raw numbers. Now, in terms of percentages, it's a higher percentage of African-Americans who are on welfare. But in terms of raw numbers and what it's costing people, it's more for, uh, more for whites relative to blacks. The other thing people talk about is affirmative action. Mitch McConnell was talking about this. Affirmative action, well, we have affirmative action. A couple problems with affirmative action. First, affirmative action is for everyone. Affirmative action was initially put in place by President Kennedy to deal with black contract work, which has happened particularly in the in the DC area, in the DMV. This is the reason why there is a lot of black progress in this particular area. However, affirmative action is for all groups who are disenfranchised and discriminated against, not just African-Americans, but for women. Uh, affirmative action has potentially made more progress for women than it has for African-Americans, but uh, can't discriminate in regards to sexual orientation, age, disability, and the like. So affirmative action is put in place for a host of groups, not specifically for uh, African-Americans. Now, now that we've dealt with that, two additional questions need to be dealt with. First, who gets paid? And second, how much should they get paid? Well, on the point of who gets paid, look, we can determine through birth records going all the way back to plantations. In fact, like my family originates from Lebanon, Tennessee on slave plantations. We have birth records to do that. We also have identification. We have licenses, working government documents, including the census where we can go back, say 10 or 20 years and look at the way people have identified and whether or not they've identified consistently. We also have genealogy tests. I've done my genealogy test. I know that my family originates from West Africa, primarily from Nigeria. So what would this mean? This would mean that Obama, President Obama and Kamala Harris wouldn't necessarily qualify, but say Cory Booker and Barbara Lee would. How much should people get paid? Well, first, we, I mean, we have the original 40 acres and a mule. Either 40 acres could be given or the cost of that money in different parts of the country. But see, these payments can also be over time. People also talk about community investments like community zones. But see, that doesn't really apply. Why? Because similar to affirmative action, it impacts everyone. And unless these dollars are going to stay in particular communities and benefit people in those communities, that can't necessarily happen. We can also think about tax reliefs, where for a period of time, 10, 20 years, people, African descendants of slaves, don't necessarily pay taxes. We can also think about down payment assistance and loan forgiveness. So look, when we talk about reparations, reparations are long overdue. There are a series of reasons in a presidents as to why this should happen. And as one of these descendants of slaves and as from a family who comes from a military family, my grandfather, my mom, my uncles, my aunt, my god brother, African-Americans have always continued to love America in ways that America hasn't necessarily loved it back. And if we truly want to get over our racial past and deal with the racial reckoning, reparations has to happen and they have to happen now. So look, as always, conversations matter like Black Lives and Books. And I hope this is sparked one.